I was always jealous that I didn't get ham on Christmas Eve. To me, the ham was a glistening symbol of American Christmas, ringed by cherry-topped pineapples and cloves. I'd envision a long dining table big enough for 20. In a warm room that smelled like pine and cinnamon, the sound of Christmas songs quietly playing in the background. Happy pairs of parents beaming while passing around ceramic casserole dishes while everyone oohed and awed and made unforced small talk. I imagined a perfectly timed laugh track as a mom playfully mussed up her daughter's hair when she dropped food on the white tablecloth. I think this entire idea got stuck in my head after receiving a holiday postcard from my dentist. <laughs> it had a famous Norman Rockwell painting on its front. Uh, it's of a family eating turkey on Thanksgiving. I, however, was an imaginative and precocious child, and this is the image that got stuck in my psyche and warped into some sort of sitcom focused on Americana and Christmas ham. My Christmas Eves were embarrassing to me as a kid. They didn't look much like my postcard. We spent them at my grandma's house, right next door to ours. We'd make the short walk over to her place around 1 p.m., and we would stay there for 12 straight hours. Uh, my grandmother, brought over from Poland as an infant, held on to old world traditions her parents instilled in her as a foreign addition to a new world. She grew up during the Great Depression. She would surely told me stories of the nuns at her school giving her nickels to run to the corner store to buy them hip flasks of whiskey and packs of cigarettes. <laughs> when I asked her what she did for fun growing up, she once told me that her and her friends pulled up cabbages from their neighbor's garden. Uh, they hit each other hit each other over the head with them until they were scolded by their parents. <laughs> My grandma was so beautiful to me, always dressed impeccably in shoes that matched her outfits and wearing colorful costume jewelry. She put lavender satchels in her dresser drawers so she smelled like them, and she permed her hair into a perfect little cloud. She was beautiful, but as a kid, I didn't think she liked us that much. I already raised four children, she told my mom when she asked to babysit after dinner one Thanksgiving night. I have other plans. What plans, my mom asked. My grandma lived alone. She basically only left her house to run errands. I got some more letters. It might finally happen this year. Mom, Prize Patrol is not going to show up at your house. Publisher's Clearinghouse is a scam. Besides, why can't the kids be there with you if they come? Bevy, they take pictures of you with the big check, you know. <laughs> And to her, that was that, a good enough reason. If Price Patrol showed up on her doorstep, she didn't need any small, dirty fingers staining her big chat. <laughs> we were only welcome at her immaculate house as long as we behaved like proper Victorian-era adults. <laughs> she had exquisite taste. Her living room was filled with relics of my grandfather's time in the Pacific Theater of World War II, ivory geisha figurines and oil paintings and glass dragons. She was so confident that no one would dare stain her white couches, she didn't even bother to cover them with plastic. <laughs> when we got bored, she played polka records for us, but she only let us dance in a small square of rug by the front door. <laughs> Grandma was also a devout Roman Catholic. A portrait of Pope John Paul II, the first Polish Pope, hung above her living room couch in a gold frame right next to pictures of our family. She attended church faithfully. My mom was more of an a la carte churchgoer. She'd pick and choose when she felt like going. The few times we did all go together, I watched as my grandma shuffled up the fading crimson aisle on her knees to receive communion with her tongue eagerly stuck out. Once the priest fed her the wafer, she crawled out of eyesight and hobbled upright. She told us you were supposed to feel the pain in your knees, that the rug burn was a reminder of the pain Jesus felt as he carried the cross on his shoulders for our sins. It was only her and one other old Polish woman dragging themselves down the aisle. <laughs> I was mortified. <laughs> I had aunts and uncles and cousins on my grandma's side, but only my mom, my siblings, and I came to her Christmas Eve dinner. She called it Vilio, and there were rules like, no eating a bite until the first star is out in the sky. 
We also couldn't eat meat, she said, only fish. I hated fish, especially the way she cooked it with dried out Ritz crackers crumbled on top. I think most of her recipes were from when my grandpa was alive, a time when black pepper was still considered spicy. <laughs> my mother ate slices of pickled herring out of the jar on the table and chased them with shots of vodka. She'd ask them to try it as we gagged. We were ladled bowls of white borscht, a sour rye bread soup with nothing floating in it but mushrooms. There was braised sauerkraut and onions and boiled eggs for some reason, Boil bowls and bowls of them. There were some highlights, thankfully, mostly Polish potato dumplings called pierogies. My sister and I would eat plates and plates of them until we could say we were too full to eat anything else. My mom told us that this was the easy version of Yaleo. When I was growing up, we had about nine versions of fish and maybe some boiled potatoes on the side. Uh, your grandma makes all this new stuff for you guys and you should be thankful. <laughs> new stuff, I think, because I pushed around an egg in my plate. Another Velio tradition was to leave an empty dining chair closest to the door in case Jesus showed up. <laughs> An available seat for Jesus, or a ghost, or a wandering stranger, I guess. One year, the front door rattled in the wind. My mom and grandma both gasped. It's Alan, they said. Alan was my uncle, my mom's oldest brother. He passed away when I was a toddler. My grandma didn't talk about it much, but my mom did. She said he had been her best friend. After the door shook, they swore it was him visiting. They were so happy. I rolled my eyes. It was obviously just the wind. All of my friends had already opened presents while we were just starting on our bowls of borscht. By the time dinner was done, it was after 10 p.m. We'd been scrunching up our noses and poking around at the food for hours, and my mom had single-handedly finished several bottles of wine. When we finally wore out my grandmother's patience, she'd send us kids to the living room. From there, I'd listen to my mom and grandma fight in the kitchen over washing dishes. My mom wanted to help, and my grandmother said she wouldn't do it right. We would listen while we stared at the wrapped presents under the tree and waited for them to finish arguing. Every year you're like this, I heard my grandma say. I knew they were talking about my mom's drinking. It was the only thing I ever heard them fight about. Most of the time it seemed like they were each other's best friends. My mom was always driving my grandma back and forth to appointments and talking on the phone with her about TV shows and such. But every once in a while, my mom's messiness would collide with, into my grandma's iciness and cause a microburst of conflict. I connected with my grandmother's way of doing things back then. She told you what she wanted without shame and people listened. She shoot me a mischievous little wink sometimes when she knew she was being particularly sassy, our little secret. There could be turmoil all around her and she would stay cool. Things in my home were confusing, but when we went to hers, we knew what the expectations were. Though some might see it as a harshness, I found comfort in her sense of self, in her beautiful, clean living room, with her breakable trinkets from around the world. I see even more clearly now. Things would have been different had she been born in a different era. She was vibrant and fashionable, and she had a dry sense of humor that would probably kill it now. She clung to her traditions partly because they were what her parents and my late grandfather loved. It was her main connection to her past. When she lost so many people too early all around her, she hardened her armor. She, like so many women from their time, burned their personality away to fit a wax mold they never even asked for. There was no other option for self-preservation. When I was older, I dated a boy whose family just recently immigrated to America from Poland. They followed many of the same traditions I know, but they called it Vigilia, uh, they, the correct word for the Polish Feast of Twelve Fishes, not Vilio. When I later Googled Vigilia, I realized that my grandma had made her own version of the feast by cobbling together pieces of the night she cherished as a child. She had moved to America during a time of cultural assimilation. Her parents didn't even want Polish spoken in their home. I asked her about Vigilia. Was her word just a regional variation of that term? But she insisted she had no idea what I was talking about. Right before she passed away, I visited her while she was in hospice care at my mom's house. 
I sat next to her. She laid in bed, and we watched the birds fly around the bird feeder outside of the window, something she always loved to do. She knew every species and which were male and female from their coloring. She had names for some of them. The bright red cardinals were her favorite. She had a serene little smile on her face as she broke the silence and pointed. That one is an asshole. <laughs> Very on brand. After a while, I asked her if she would tell me some of her Christmas recipes so I could write them down. As far as I knew, she cooked everything from memory. I might have been a bratty eater as a kid, but after I moved 2,000 miles away from home, I immediately craved dishes I grew up with, and there's no good Polish food to be found in San Diego. I especially wanted her recipe for brogis, the dumplings my sister and I shoveled down every year. What's in the dough, I asked. It was so soft and delicate. I had tried using recipes I saw online, but they hadn't come close to duplicating it. Oh, uh, flour, water, sometimes egg, she said. <laughs> Some, sometimes egg? <laughs> uh, yes, you know, sometimes you have them, sometimes you don't. <laughs> When pressed for exact measurement, she didn't have an answer. She knew it felt right, that's what she did. I scribbled down what details I could, and I told her I tried to get it right. I know you will do it, she said confidently. She patted my hand and winked, and I felt so proud. I think of that empty chair at my grandma's holiday table. I wonder who the remnants of my small family were truly waiting for. My grandfather, my deceased uncle, or any number of departed loved ones. Maybe just a distraction of some kind from our own imperfections. We all made the best of what we were served, but we were loud and messy, and we made it hard for my grandma to keep her protective shield up. Vileo made all of us, even her, very tired. My Christmas Eve now looks pretty different. Shortly after I moved to San Diego, my little sister moved in with me. Her, my husband, and I make a big feast with him, of course. <laughs> We wear comfortable clothes and smoke weed and relax. <laughs> the only challenge we take on is the pierogies. We're going on year five of making them together, around 100 each time. <laughs> We've gotten close to grandma's, but we haven't nailed it just yet. I know we'll get there. <laughs> I also keep an empty chair at my table. At first, it was because the only people I really considered family were my husband and sister. Now I suppose I could include others at my small table, my chosen family and friends. I think I'll always leave one empty though. What if my grandmother shows up? She deserves a seat and I'll offer her our pierogies to try. She could open presents before dark if she wants to. She can even have some ham. I bet she'd enjoy it and she could call our celebration any word she wants. Damn, first time of Jessica Stevens. All right, guys, thank you so much. Let's get one more round of applause for tonight's storytellers. We had Jordan Coburn, Kate McGovern, Kirsten Hernandez, Joe Hudak.